Hello and welcome. Tonight, President Bola Tinubu meets with security chiefs for the first time since assumption into office demands stronger coordination among security agencies. Group Chief Executive Officer of Nigerian National Petroleum Company Limited, Mele Kiari, assures Nigerians of adequate supply of PMS as he emphasizes that payment of fuel subsidy is no longer sustainable. House of Representatives asks federal government to declare a state of emergency on drug abuse in the country. On business news tonight, the Central Bank of Nigeria seeks monetary and fiscal policy convergence to enhance economic growth. On sports news tonight, Paris Saint-Germain coach Christopher Galtier confirms Argentina forward Lionel Messi will leave the club at the end of the season following strained relationship with the fans. From Abuja, the nation's capital, one of the witnesses called by the PDP and its presidential candidate, Atiku Abubakar, tells election petition tribunal that he was forced to sign the presidential election results in Kogi State. And in international news from London, Australia's most decorated living soldier, Ben Robert Smith, has lost a historic defamation case against three newspapers that accused him of war crimes in Afghanistan. And President Bola Tinubu has met with security chiefs for the first time after his assumption into office. The president did not mince words that he would not tolerate a situation where security agencies are working at cross purposes. At the end of the meeting, which was attended by the chief of defense staff, service chiefs, the inspector general of police and heads of intelligence agencies, the president explained that his approach to security issues will be the adoption of contemporary security measures to advance the country's security fortunes. Addressing State House correspondents after the meeting, the National Security Advisor, General Babagana Monguno, disclosed that the President demands frequent consultations in tandem with the demands of the nation. Our State House correspondent, Gloria Mizuke, reports. For the first time since his assumption into office, President Bola Tinubu meets with security chiefs, the Inspector General of Police and security agencies at the State House. The President issued a mandate to the chiefs premised on his ideologies on how security should be tackled. We have left Mr. President um, fired with that mandate and to uh, realign um, you know, our interventions to, to fit the expectations, not just of Nigerians, of course, with the mandate that Mr. President has given to us. The President again promised a reform in the system, issuing caution to security agencies against working at variance with themselves. In moving this country forward, he needs the security agencies to redouble their efforts and he's also pointed out that his own philosophy is one of contemporary security measures on the issues of oil theft. That he is not going to tolerate. Wherever the problem is coming from, it must be crushed as soon as possible. All agencies must work to achieve one single purpose. Working at cross purposes and colliding with each other is not something that he will condone. Please. Separately, President Tinubu met with the President of the Senate, Senator Ahmed Lawan, who is accompanied by the Speaker of the House of Representatives in his office. I find it beautiful and necessary uh, to work uh, with all the major stakeholders, especially the leadership of our country, uh, Mr. President particularly, uh, to ensure that I uh, give the necessary uh, uh, my necessary opinion and advice on how the new uh, leadership of the National Assembly should emerge and what we need to do to ensure stability. We are getting somewhere, our prayer is we're able to resolve all the outstanding issues by the grace of God. In a chat with the Speaker of the House of Representatives, Channel's Television sought affirmation about his appointment as Chief of Staff to the President. So, congratulations is in order. Um, it hasn't been made official. Is there a reason for that? Be patient. Be patient. The system works in its own way. Um, yeah, let this allow the system to work. 
So before the end of the day. We'll see. We'll see, we'll see, we'll see. Thank you. The meeting of the National Assembly leadership is followed by APC anointed candidates for speakership, Honorable Tajjin Abbas, and Deputy Speakership, Honorable Ben Kalu. We restricted our discussions to the matters of the day, issues that have to do with the challenges that uh, this country is facing, particularly the economic and social uh, challenges, and uh, what he intends to do within the next few days, beginning with what he has done on the issue of uh, for subsidy. Issues of other con uh, candidates uh, did not form part of what we discussed with Mr. President. The president wrapped up activities in the office with the visit of the chairman of the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, Mr. Abdul Rashid Bauer, who is seen at the presidential villa for the second time in 24 hours. From the presidential villa, Gloria Umezuke, Channels Television News. Well, staying with security, troops of the Nigerian military say they have neutralized 58 suspected Boko Haram and Islamic State West Africa uh, province Iswap terrorists and rescued over 60 kidnapped victims in the northern region within the last two weeks. The Director of Defense Media Operations, Major General Musa Dan Madami, who disclosed this while briefing journalists at the defense headquarters Abuja, also said over 800 suspected terrorists surrendered, while more than 100 others were arrested. Troops also neutralized 26 Boko Haram and Islamic State of West African province terrorists, including one suicide bomber, arrested 22 terrorist logistics suppliers, two terrorist spies and informants, and captured one Boko Haram an Islamic State of West African promised terrorist fighter. Within a week in view, troops in the north central zone of the country also neutralized seven bandits, apprehended 35 suspected criminals, and rescued 14 kidnapped civilians. Troops also arrested eight foreign illegal miners at Anchor Local Government in Anchor Local Government of Zamfara State. Like I told you several on several occasions, we know about what is happening in Benue. And uh, to the best of my knowledge, I know that a military solution might not bring a total end to that one. It must be a political and a total uh, all-government approach to the solution in the Benin state. Away from security, the managing director of the Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation Limited, Mr. Mele Kiari, is asking Nigerians not to panic about the supply of PMS, assuring that the corporation has enough supply of the product to serve the country for several days. Uh, Mr. Kiari also points out that he aligns himself with the removal of subsidy because it's no longer sustainable. He addressed this and other issues surrounding the few subsidy removal when he appeared on our political program, Politics Today. Actually, the subsidy regime vanished on the 17th of February 2022. The law said that six months after the enactment of the Petroleum Industry Act, petroleum products, particularly PMS, must be priced at market rates. That means, by law, the subsidy regime is gone by the 17th of February 2022. But of course, uh, government can always decide to spend on its citizen in the manner that it wants. Government, in its wisdom, decided that there will be appropriation for subsidy in 2022 and also provision for subsidy up to the half of 2023. That means that you know, provision is made, but the law said price it at the market. So you can choose to spend your money, which is what government did. But you only spend money that you have shown. Mm -hmm. Government did not fund the subsidy because it didn't have the money to fund it. I think the general understanding that since there is a provision in the Appropriation Act, it means that there's a subsidy regime up to the end of the June. Technically correct, but you know, budget is budget. You have to fund your budget. If you don't have your, fund your budget, it doesn't exist. So we look at, I mean, the understanding a lot of Nigerians have is that subsidy removal will be effected on 1st of July this year. And since there is a budgetary provision for it to the June ended, why the sudden change of the timeline? The same answer, because the, you have a budget, you do not have to cash to back it, you are not paying for it. That means another institution will carry it. And what happened is the NMPC has been carrying this from its cash flow. 
Remember that NMPC is a private company now. It must pay taxes, royalties, just like any other company. And you know, we're not designed to food the subsidy bill. The subsidy bill is for the Federation. And the Federation didn't have the money to pay for it. Yeah, when they made the provision in the budget, after 17th of February, and they did not fund it, that means that technically government is not able to fund it since February 2022. So since February 2022, who has been responsible for paying the subsidy? NNPC Limited, on the back of its cash flow, taking money from our other operations, from our core businesses to foot the subsidy bill with the hope and belief that will be reimbursed. And that reimbursement is not forthcoming. That is uh, over two trillion now. Yes, it is. That is accumulated, 40 billion every accumulated. month. Accumulated. And what we did, and of course the, this explanation is very useful also, NNPC is supposed to pay taxes and royalties. So we held them back. Because we can't pay, you can't give me your money, and then you ask me to pay for it. So federal government yes. is owing NNPC, and NNPC is also owing Nigeria. Is that the true situation of things? No, not per In royalties and in taxes. Federal, yeah. See, the, see, the, no. federal, the federal government there is used supposed to, be, to listen, pay for something. Go ahead, please. There used to be a distinction between federal government and the federation mm -hmm. in terms of the ownership of the old NMPC. This company, the NMPC Limited, is now owned by the federation. That's a distinction. That means whatever NMPC does is doing on behalf of the federation. Mm -hmm. So that's the distinction. Therefore, the federation is unable to settle its subsidy bill since the end of the subsidy regime that is brought in, into place by the law and since February the 17th. So since that time also, since that uh, obligation of not meeting of the subsidy repayment, NMPC2 has not been able to meet oh, its... Yeah, we can. On top of that, there's still a balance of over 2.8 trillion. Naira. That's the point I'm making. Interesting. You hold back the fiscal obligations, you also have a deficit of 2.8 trillion Naira. Why are Nigerians paying for uh, a new price for the old products? Two distinct situations, uh, very separate. Because once there's indication of change in price, which everyone knows that it's likely to be higher price. So two things happen. Consumers will rush to the station so that they can take advantage of the old prices you know, in anticipation that something will change the next day. So that's why you see motorists go back to the fuel station, sort of buying 10,000 naira fuel, you buy 20, 30,000 naira, with the hope that when the prices change the next day, that you would have taken advantage of it. And the other side of it is inventory management. Every trading company would hold back that inventory with the belief that when prices change, they can now sell at the, at the new price. I, I think this is natural because it does happen, it may be, not be intentional, but obviously, it's something that is clearly happens under every circumstance. Who is profiting from this now? I don't think it's profiting. Is it the market? Yes, let me tell you. Uh, when you change, have this, you have a cheap price in a product in your hand, and then you now sell it maybe two, three times the price of what you have purchased, but you are going to go back to the market. That means when you go back to the market to procure new supply, you are going to buy at the new price. But literally, you again will be clearly marginal because for you to continue doing that business, you have to add money to buy to, uh, in, the, in the next market. What this situation has brought is potentially some form of efficiency will come into the system. No doubt about it. It's very, very pr practical. Do we have enough product? Today, to sell? I have 1.8 billion liters of uh, petroleum motor spirit or premium metal spirit in our hands today. So that means that if you don't do anything, I will have sufficient fuel for the next 30 days in my hands. We see a list of prices across state. Is that from the NNPC? Yes, you have seen a document in the, in the space there. You know, every company does this, you know. It's a, really a marketing document. It's really not a price announcement document. Every company keeps this record, adjusts it appropriately on the basis of changing conditions in the market. So this is natural. Every company in this business does this. So what you have seen is just an internal company document. It finds its way into the, into the internet. Not surprising. It came from the NNPC? Yeah, it is an NNPC document, but it was not intended to be an announcement. It is not an announcement because it can change the next day. It can go lower. When we see lower prices, we will bring this down. That means that you have prices by location. Mind you. So by Monday, you are telling Nigerians tonight, are these queues we go away? I do not see it actually beyond Saturday. So what, what, what kind of, uh, I mean, what of authority can you give us? The authority first, you have supply. But the key trouble with uh, PMS uh, uh, system is supply. So I have supply. 
Well, for more on that interview, you can head over to our YouTube channel forward slash channels web. In part two, after the break, House of Representatives asks federal government to declare a state of emergency on drug abuse in the country. That's in a moment. You join us again. Welcome back. If you just joined us, you're watching the news at 10 live on Channels Television. Here's a reminder of our top stories. President Bola Tinubu meets with security chiefs for the first time since his assumption into office, demands stronger coordination among security agencies. Group Chief Executive Officer of Nigeria National Petroleum Company Limited, Mele Kiari, assures Nigerians of adequate supply of PMS as he emphasizes that payment of fuel subsidy is no longer sustainable. House of Representatives asks federal government to declare a state of emergency on drug abuse in the country. And Russia blames Ukraine for shelling across the border, which has left at least eight persons injured. The House of Representatives is asking the federal government to outrightly remove subsidies on all petroleum products. The House made this resolution after adopting the report of its ad hoc committee, which investigated the country's subsidy regime. However, the House wants the federal government to immediately design measures and palliatives to cushion the effects of the subsidy removal for Nigerians. Also, the House is asking the president to declare a state of emergency on drug abuse in the country. Our correspondent Terry Kumi has more. The House of Representatives convenes for the last plenary of the week as the Ninth National Assembly approaches its end. The membership of the National Council on On a day filled with bills and reports for consideration, the House spares time for one matter of urgent public importance. Honorable Francis Agbo draws the attention of the House to what he describes as a drug menace in the country and the challenges of the National Drug Law Enforcement Agency. So far, government at all levels, and particularly the federal government, has continued to pay lip service to the war against illicit drug abuse as the NDLA remains underfunded, understaffed, and ill-equipped. It will interest you to know that even as we speak today, many of the arms and ammunition used to prosecute this war, especially in the hinterland, aside Lagos and Abuja, many of the arms were arms used during the Nigerian Civil War. Plus two. In the meantime, the House adopts the report of its Committee on Basic Education and Services on a bill to amend the Teachers Registration Council of Nigeria Act to ensure that only licensed or registered and qualified persons who exhibit thorough professional conduct teach in schools. Our schools, irrespective of level, are filled with quacks, people with fake certificates. In fact, recently it was announced that 75% of teachers in the private schools, primary and secondary, have no basic qualifications in Nigeria. So that potentially, that will also increase the penalties. Previously, it was from 500 naira to 1,000 naira for defiling a child. Having kind of knowledge of an innocent child, 500, 1,000, and they stay on the job. We've refined that to say, once you are indicted, you have to be suspended and if you are convicted, there are certain penalties, including the withdrawal of the teaching teacher's license. Meanwhile, 24 hours after supporting the new president on his stance on subsidy removal, the House is asking the government to put immediate measures in place to cushion the effect on Nigerians. The government should also introduce intermodal, regional and national transport system to ease mass movement of people across the country. The House also asked the federal government to immediately suspend all direct sales, direct purchase contracts, and that all the agencies involved in crude lifting and security should have a representative with the Nigerian Navy as a lead agency to physically assess and document daily crude production and lifting. No, this one Terry Ikumi, Channels Television News. Meanwhile, the Inter-Party Advisory Council is raising dust over the timing of the removal of fuel subsidy by the federal government as it believes that the removal is at variance with the expectations of Nigerians in view of the current living conditions of the people.
Addressing a news conference in Abuja, the national chairman of the council, Mr. Yabagi Sani, says, whereas the subsidy removal is necessary for the nation's economic growth, the timing and manner of the adjustment without palliative measures in place is unhealthy for the well-being of majority of Nigerians. Mr. Sani explains that the removal of huge subsidy should have been done at a more suitable time in view of the fact of the Petroleum Industry Act 2022 and Appropriation Act 2023, the extant laws as well as Mr. President's pronouncement in his inaugural speech that it was clear that he will govern by the rule of law. And now to a situation report on a few subsidy residents of the nation's capital and some states across the north are lamenting the effects of the new pump price for petroleum products in the country. The long queues have disappeared in some states, including the federal capital, as the prices for the product vary between 500 naira and 600 naira per litre in Abuja and the northern states. However, the Nigerian midstream and downstream regulatory authority is promising to protect consumers from unnecessary profiteering by oil marketers to ensure that Nigerians get maximum value for every litre of fuel purchased. Our correspondent Dili Omoyeni reports on the situation across northern Nigeria. The first of Sydney is gone. With that pronouncement on Monday, Nigerians went into a panic mood on Tuesday morning, leaving long queues at fuel stations in their wake. The fuel queues would later disappear following the release of a new pricing template by the Nigerian National Petroleum Company Limited, which has not been well received by Nigerians. I was supposed to fill this tank like 8,000 naira, but how much did I spend now? 26,000 naira. Is it unfair? At least. The federal government would have said, okay, let us bring buses to alleviate the situation. Federal assisted mass transit buses from location to location. So that right now, as I'm speaking with you, I moved from Kuje to this place for a thousand naira. And it was 300, it used to be 300 some, some hours ago. Across northern Nigeria, the prices differ from state to state. While the price range hovers around 537 naira and 540 naira per litre. In states like Yobe, Boronu, Zanfara, Katsina and Gombe, the product is sold between 540 naira and 600 naira per litre. A country that has a minimum wage of 30,000 naira and you are now buying fuel for more than 30,000 naira per, uh, for a full tank, it means the whole thing is not matching. Nevertheless, the regulators of the sector are promising to protect Nigerians from profiteering by oil marketers while warning against hoarding of the products. And ourselves, NNDPRA and uh, FCCPC, are going to be there to make sure that the consumer is not taken advantage of, so there is no profiteering. The players must play by the rules. There is no need to hold because NPC has ample supplies and they have been selling. You know, obviously, uh, because of lack of clarity on uh, Monday, there are a lot of uh, station owners and the depot owners that are holding back. But again, in most places now, the seven uh, people are buying in. And if you looked at, especially somewhere around Abuja and Lagos, it's just drive in, drive out. So for those in the hinterland, please let them just be rest assured that the market is open and there's ample petroleum products, uh, especially premium motor spirit, uh, to go around the whole country. Now, for many Nigerians in the nation's capital, it's no longer about the availability of the product, as the queues have drastically reduced. But many Nigerians complain about the cost of the product, which has drastically reduced their purchasing power and, of course, increased the prices of goods and services. Dili Omoyeni, Channels Television News. Well, we head over to the south where the situation appears to be mixed. While some city centers are still dealing with availability issues, others have premium motor spirits in abundance, but they lament the high cost and its effect on inflation. They're appealing to the federal government to look for a way around the difficult situation and cushion the impact. Hi. 
A seal by President Bola Tinubu's nascent administration on his predecessor's fiscal policy over fuel subsidy removal causes immediate shocks in the economy. Few cars at this fuel station in Abe Okotogun State is indicative that the citizens are now re-evaluating their priorities in managing costs that accommodate the hike in price as queues are beginning to disappear here, although the product is available. Life is becoming something else for the people. Means of transportation, amongst other things. So uh, in as much as we have sympathy for the new president, uh, I also want to say that uh, the implementation of this policy must have human face. The change in pump price at this filling station in Calabar reflects the new reality, and some residents in the Cross River State capital believe this borders on despondency. I don't think uh, we can cope with the rate or the amount of or with the rate of things are escalating at the moment. Something that would have taken 100 naira, I'm going to pay about 400 naira now because of high cost of fuel. You heard him right, and the Edo State government officials are visiting to verify claims by marketers on cost of purchase. So we bought where at 450 this morning from Kama. That's why we are selling at the rate of 500. This morning, 450. We received product this morning. We bought where this morning. Let's go where we and it's also why this resident is unhappy, blaming it on greed by marketers. Can you show the invoice you received this morning? That would be your only defense. The situation in Ondo State is a bit dire, as some outlets in the city are either shut down or opened but not selling. The place where they carry Ondo near before, if I won't carry it, I go tell her, say, take it on there, anybody tell me, say, because I beg. Say, I won't leave her, wait, don't beg me. The scene in Asaba, the Delta State capital, is either that of an empty outlet or that of those who have no choice but to buy the product at around 500 naira per liter. Some residents question the timing. So a publication stating the new prices. So it has come to stay. To me, it's not the right time, actually, because we're coming out from stress, entering another stress again. Okay, so it's not the right time. If you ask from my own uh, opinion, it's not the right time. However you look at it, this is the latest chapter in Nigeria's economic reality and the nearest future will either vilify or vindicate the president's decision. We head over to Abuja Studios for more. Hi Gloria, it's over to you. Oh, thank you, Millicent. From the fuel subsidies saga, we move to the presidential election petition tribunal where one of the witnesses called by the council to the PDP and its presidential candidate, Atiku Abubakar, has told the court that he was forced to sign the presidential election results in Kogi state. Meanwhile, the Labour Party and its presidential candidate, Mr. Peter Obi, says they would be challenging the presidential election results in 18 states only, excluding the results in states where they won convincingly and without any dispute. At the end of the day's proceedings, they tendered certified true copies of the electoral documents obtained from the Independent National Electoral Commission in only six states. Our correspondent, Emanuela Ekele, has the report. The presidential candidate of Labour Party, Mr. Peter Obi, and his vice, Dati Baba Ahmed, are back for the definite hearing of the petition against the February the 25th presidential election results. The sight of senior lawyers exchanging pleasantries and chatting ahead of each sitting has become a norm. The five-man panel of justices, led by Justice Haruna Samani, arrive and gets into the business of the day. The petition by the Labour Party is the first on the list. Led by senior lawyer Emeka Opoku, they said they will be challenging the presidential election results in 18 states only. They, however, tender certified true copies of electoral documents obtained from the Independent National Electoral Commission in only six states. The documents mainly forms EC8A from polling units were admitted as exhibits by the chairman of the panel, Justice Haruna Samani. However, INEC that issued the documents objected to their admissibility. Counsel to the APC and Tinubu also objected. A breakdown of the tendered and admitted documents showed that forms EC8A were tendered in 15 local government areas of River State. 23 in Benway, 18 in Cross River, 23 in Niger State, 20 in Oshun, and 16 in Ekiti State. Initially, yes, we had some features, but along the line, everything went on smoothly. Where all the state's documents we wanted to tender, not tender, 
the six states and the local governments that we came with were all tendered and the court marked, I mean, uh, I said, I admitted all of them. The party also wonders why INEC will object to the admissibility of their own documents. It is shocking to us, too, that INEC would be attacking their own documents, processes that emanated from them. They are objecting it. Not only that those things came from them, they certified it. And when you certify a document, it means I have the original copy in my custody, and I hereby give you this one, which I have certified, confirming that in my custody I have the original. Back in the courtroom, the petition of the People's Democratic Party is next. The party presented its first three witnesses, state coalition officers of Ogun, Kogi and Abia, in the continuation of hearing of its petition. Retired Captain Joe Agada of Kogi State says they were forced to sign the presidential election results sheets. Solarin Adekunle of Ogun State disclosed incidents of voter intimidation and manipulation of results, and Uzoma Abonta of Abia State said there were discrepancies in the results declared by INEC. The case has been adjourned to June 2nd for continuation of hearing. Emanuela Ekele, Channels Television News. The immediate past to Governor Vikiti State, Mr. Kayode Fayame, is under interrogation at the Office of the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC. The ex-governor is at the Zonal Command of the Anti-Graft Agency in Ilori, the Kwara State capital. According to sources privy to the development, Mr. Fayami arrived at the Ilori office of the Anti-Graft Agency at about 10 a.m. today. Operatives of the EFCC grilled the former governor over allegations of a 4 billion naira misappropriation. The probe is set to be connected to the handling of funds during his tenure as governor of Ikiti State. The former governor had reportedly written to the EFCC seeking to delay his invitation over the alleged misappropriation of funds. He was said to have requested a postponement owing to his participation in the launch of two books in honor of former President Muhammadu Buhari. The head of Nigeria Office West African Examination Council, WIAC, Mr. Patrick Aregan, is asking students writing the ongoing senior school examination in the country to desist from all forms of examination malpractice. Speaking in Abuja while monitoring the exercise, Mr. Aregan says the council has put measures in place to fish out persons trying to circumvent the 2023 examination. He adds that the WIAC will cancel results of any school found to have engaged in any form of examination malpractice. Uh, we are not interested in failing candidates. We are interested in seeing them pass. But the only thing is that we cannot help them to pass. We cannot help them to fail. We only encourage them. We tell them what to do and what not to do. So um, the two schools we have visited so far were with us. Atmosphere very conducive, orderly. And if what we are seeing is anything to go by, we can say yes, the mission is going on very, very well. And we are talking to them to ensure that they do not involve themselves in any act of examination malpractice. Uh, you know what they call road website. See what they do. You know, some dubious supervisors. Because we, we have a regulation that we release the question papers, or rather the question booklets, to supervisors one hour before commencement time to enable them to go from the collection point to the administration point. Because some schools are far flown. That's why that regulation is there for one hour. But what do they do? Some will get to the center, they will not put it on that table, supervisors, they will open it and take their phone and snap it. And they belong to different syndicate groups, row websites, they will snap it and post it. But you begin to ask yourself the question. What are they trying to achieve? What are they doing? They are not destroying the future of these candidates. They are already in the exam hall and you are posting something, who is going to use it? Well, that's it from the nation's capital. It's back to you, Melissa. Thanks, Loria. And digital supply chain financing platform Fiducia has officially been launched in Nigeria to help micro, small and medium enterprises get funded speedily. Via the platform, buyers, suppliers and investors can trade eligible receivables and carry out other forms of supply chain finance. Micro, small and medium enterprises play an important role in the growth of Nigeria's economy. But according to the International Finance Corporation, 
90% of them name access to finance as their largest barrier to growth. Which is why Fiducia, a digital supply chain financing platform, is launching in Nigeria to help fill up the funding gap for MSMEs. In this ever-changing environment, companies must adapt, embrace innovation to remain competitive and relevant. And that is exactly what Fiducia aims to do. By leveraging cutting-edge technology, building a community of financiers and suppliers, we offer businesses an opportunity to unlock the true potential of their supply chain. The supply chain finance landscape is changing, and partners and supporters of the brand make a case for why supply chain financing with Fiducia is the future. Ladies and gentlemen, we officially reveal to you. After almost a year of being tested, the brand is finally revealed to Nigerians. An introduction to the platform shows how vendors and suppliers Founders as well as large corporates can benefit from the solution. Fiducia is a digital platform for supply chain finance. It's a marketplace, which means that um, it's bank agnostic and there are multiple financiers. It's designed to bring the lowest possible financing to suppliers and buyers alike. The same technology has supplied about $3 billion in the last one year on this platform, so it's a tried and tested platform. The Fiducia platform is a working capital funding solution achieved through a digital marketplace that brings together buyers, sellers, and providers of funds into a central marketplace. And then we as Fiducia set the rules, set the environment in a secure manner to enable trade relationships get funded by the funders. Scaling supply chain finance has the potential to expand access to financing for Nigerian MSMEs. And with Fiducia, SMEs can discount their invoices for cash speedily and become credit worthy. Now time for business news. Here's Joker Rogers. Banking so easy, so simple. Dow Star 894 hash now to experience it. You first, first bank. Thanks, Melissa. Welcome to Business News. Nigeria's Apex Monetary Authority, the central bank, today hosted a retreat of the Fiscal Liquidity Assessment Committee, the fourth in a series of meetings to articulate policy decisions that will enhance economic growth. The Director of Monetary Policy Department of the CBN, Mr. Hassan Mahmoud, says it's an avenue to seek new ways to help the Nigerian economy recover from the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. Government spending now, and you know, a lot of it will have been said there's liquidity stress. Liquidity stress means that we're having need for higher expenditure or expenditure outlets, but revenue flows are leaning. The same thing also on the central bank side. While we are also looking at our monetary data and managing liquidity, we're also mindful of how that is now impacting on growth, on the banking sector stability. And the most critical part of it now is that digitalization. So all things that we do before, now we see uh, mobile money, online payment, fintechs, new players, apart from the conventional banks that we have now, are also coming into that space. So there's a need to, for us to be looking and reappraising this development and be coordinating our activities such that we are adopting these uh, new measures or new dis emerging developments, at the same time maximizing on the potentials of those developments for the advancement of our economy. So that's why we give it that name in the digital age. That is what we have. Central Bank has already launched a CBDC, we have our e-Naira, we have other fintechs, players, mobile solution providers, all within the system. So it's within that space that we are looking at this coordination between fiscal and monetary authority and other players within the, within the ecosystem of the Nigerian economy to have this what we call uh, inclusive and sustainable growth. 
In the meantime, the current multiple exchange rate system operated by Nigeria's central bank uh, could worsen future debt service payments and increase the risk of debt distress, and that's according to the World Bank President David Malpass. In a post on the bank's website, Mr. Malpass said efforts to bring about unification of the foreign exchange market in Nigeria and other developing countries have been difficult for various reasons. The World Bank chief believes that multiple exchange rate systems could lead to lower economic growth and make debt servicing obligations more burdensome. The World Bank chief highlights the institution's approach to curbing the problem, some of which will not, is not to provide budget support assistance to countries with significant foreign exchange rate premiums. Nigeria, according to the World Bank, has a premium distortion difference of 61% as of March 2023. Nigeria's headline purchasing managers index has risen above the 50-point mark for the second month in May to 54.0 from 53.8 in April, signaling a strong improvement in business conditions as output and new orders increased. And that's according to the latest analysis released by Stambic IBTC. This uptick follows the two months of decline seen around the worst cash crisis in the first quarter of the year. However, input costs rose sharply again, with output prices up, while the rate of inflation eased to the weakest since April 2020. Also, purchase prices continued to rise sharply, although at a softer pace, while business activity accelerated for the second month running. However, firms continue to operate a cautious approach with regards to hiring. Although business expansion plans and predictions of further improvements in new orders supported positive forecasts, confidence dipped and was the second lowest on record. One of Nigeria's indigenous financial institutions, Wemba Bank PLC, has declared growth in gross earnings of 42% from 92.12 billion naira in 2021 to 131.08 billion naira in 2022. The bank made the announcement at its annual general meeting, which was held in Lagos, as shareholders attended the meeting virtually. It's the 2022 annual general meeting of Wemma Bank PLC. The board members seat with the shareholders who joined virtually as the 2022 annual report and statement of account. I now formally present and lay before you the bank's audited financial statement as of 31st December 2022 and the reports of directors, auditors and audit committee thereon, which have been sent to all shareholders as required by Section 388, Subsection 1, of the Companies and Allied Matters Act 2020. A look at the financial scorecard shows that the bank emerged stronger in the year under review, recording gross earnings of 131 billion naira compared to the previous year, while the profit after tax grew by 26%. Shareholders are rewarded with a final dividend of 30 Kobo per share. With the work they have done, you are you 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 can and I'm confident the GMD and the women to it position at the top he hit the ground a major agenda for the day is the election and re-election of directors electronically. What is that on the display of the instructions? Step four, press one if you are casting your vote on all units. Otherwise, press the appropriate option. Thank you. It was a very participatory uh, meeting. Um, all the resolutions were passed and um, uh, the results speak for themselves. Um, all we will say is that we will continue on the trajectory of performance as we have always done and, and the market should be on the watch out um, that we will continue uh, to work as we have planned. Uh, the aim is to scale this bank and that we will and that we must do as we promised our shareholders. So it was a very successful outing. We're, we're very happy and we give kudos to our shareholders for all the support over the years. We're in a good place now and the best is yet to come. 
Wemma Bank PLC says it is committed to being the dominant digital platform for banking in Africa, delivering a seamless financial report and services. More figures. The equities market sustained its bullish performance, although marginal, to end today's session. Let's take a look at those figures, and here's Ine John Mekwa. Thank you so much. Welcome to the stock market report. Well, a 69% drop in market value, 41% drop in volume, 23% drop in the deals has brought us an activity chart that is holy red, even though the value is still looking really high at 5.72 billion naira and volume at 390. In spite of this red, however, we're still able to have the bull on the floor of the market. So it's still a slim win. Uh, they're having it at 0.07%, but we still have a 55,000 level. In fact, we've won from 55,700 is what it was yesterday to 55,800. So we're still looking a bit good there. 30 trillion naira is the market cap. And uh, well, it's still positive. So let's see the details of this. Banking recovered from that deep red that it had yesterday. Access Co and UBA are still in the red, but the other figures have done very well. So we see. Banking, almost 1% up there. And then looking at oil and gas, looking even much better. The giants like Total, Eterna Oil, uh, they've added to this. And Conor Oil also did very well. So we have oil and gas positive there, 2.27%. But consumer goods has not been able to cross over yet. It's still in the red. And that's because of Nigeria breweries and international breweries. So it's a slim win, but we are green. And we hope it stays that way until we can have bigger gains. That's the Stock Market Report. I'm Ine John Mekwa. Back to you, Joke. That's Business News on the News at 10. Millicent, back to you. Thanks, Joke. Russian region of Belgorod has again come under attack from across the Ukrainian border with at least eight people injured in the process. Russia's defense ministry has also claimed it thwarted other attempts by Ukraine to invade the region. Kyiv is yet to comment on the allegations but has denied involvement in previous attacks across the border. Here's Simon Pusey with other international stories and around the world in five. Good evening and welcome to the channel's studios here in London with your international news around the world in five. Australia's most decorated living soldier, Ben Roberts Smith, has lost a historic defamation case against three newspapers that accused him of war crimes in Afghanistan. The Sydney Morning Herald, The Age and the Canberra Times newspapers in 2018 ran articles accusing Robert Smith of playing a part in the unlawful killings of six Afghans during his deployment. The 44-year-old, here meeting the Queen in 2014, claims he suffered a substantial loss of earnings following the newspaper allegations. The civil trial was the first time a court has assessed accusations of war crimes by Australian forces. A judge said four of the six murder allegations, all denied by the soldier, were substantially true. The findings by Justice Anthony Bosanko today that Robert Smith participated in the execution of Afghans confirms our reports that the Victoria Cross recipient breached the Geneva Convention and is a critical step towards justice for the families of the murder victims. Moscow's relentless aerial assaults on Ukraine have killed another three people on Thursday, including a nine-year-old girl, her mother and another woman who were shot out of a shelter. Ukraine said it shot down 10 ballistic and Iskander cruise missiles in Russia's 18th attack on the capital, Kyiv, since the start of May. But a nine-year-old girl, her mother and another woman died when rocket debris fell near an air raid shelter that they had been trying to enter. We have uh, weeks long, uh, every day, the Russian sender can get the drone and, and missiles to our hometown. And a lot of people killed, a lot of buildings destroyed. Uh, we have uh, uh, a big part of people who have an injury. And uh, yes, of course, uh, people uh, people very angry. People very angry. It's not the war, it's genocide against Ukraine, against Ukrainian people from Russia. The House of Representatives has approved a deal to allow the United States to borrow more money days before the world's biggest economy was due to start defaulting on its debts. The days are 314, the days are 117. The bill is passed. 
The measure easily passed the chamber by a vote of 314 to 117, despite some defections on both sides of the aisle. The Senate must vote on the bill later this week before President Joe Biden can sign it into law. The government is forecast to hit its borrowing limit on Monday the 5th of June. That has left little margin for error as lawmakers race to avoid the U.S. defaulting on its $31.4 trillion debt, which underpins the global financial system. European leaders have met for a security meeting during the European Political Community Summit in Moldova. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky took part in the roundtable. Earlier, he reiterated Ukraine's desire to join the European Union after arriving in Moldova, which borders Ukraine. The European Political Community Summit brings together over 40 European leaders. Entrepreneur Elon Musk has praised staff at a Tesla factory in China's commercial hub of Shanghai. I would like to just uh, very much uh, con congratulate you on the amazing work that you've done. It's been incredibly impressive uh, how you have been able to overcome so many difficulties and so many challenges. The video of Musk's visit to Tesla's Shanghai factory the automaker's biggest production hub showed him making an address and posing for photos with a Giga Shanghai sign flanked by hundreds of employees. The U.S. billionaire departed Shanghai on Thursday, wrapping up a two-day trip to China in which he met senior Chinese government officials, including the highest-ranking vice premier. And a white beluga whale, first sighted off the coast of northern Norway in 2019, has reappeared near Sweden in the past few weeks. The beluga, nicknamed Haldemir, became a local celebrity when it was first seen off the coast of northern Norway, wearing a harness printed with Equipment St. Petersburg, with a camera mount attached. This led some to speculate it was part of a Russian spy training program. The whale had been making its way southward along the Norwegian coast since 2019, but it was seen off Sweden's southwestern coast last week. And that's your international news around the world in five. Now back to the channel's studios in Lagos. Thanks, Simon. On Sports News, Nigeria Premier League site in Ugurinja and Bendel Insurance will play the final of this year's Nigeria Federation Cup. A late goal from Rangers Godwin Obaje against Plato United in Ijebode Ogun State and Bendel Insurance 4 2 triumph over Wari Wolves on penalties in Lagos secured the spot for both sides. And it's about time to say goodbye Paris Saint-Germain for Lionel Messi who will be leaving the club at the end of this season as confirmed by his coach Christopher Galtier. Messi has 21 goals and 20 assists for PSG in all competitions this season but his relationship with the fans are sought as the club fell short in their pursuit of Champions League glory truncating an option to possibly extend an initial two-year deal. Meanwhile, Spain, Spain defender Jordi Alba bids an emotional farewell to Barcelona after 11 years at the Catalan giant. Alba, who joined the club in 2012, has played more than 450 games for Barcelona, winning the Champions League in 2015, six La Liga titles, five Copa del Rey titles, four Spanish Super Cups, and the Club World Cup. Listen, that's it on Sports Series. It's back to you. Thanks, Jeffrey. And just before we go, uh, one more story on the foreign scene. The U.S. President Joe Biden has tripped and fallen while handing out diplomas at a graduation ceremony for the U.S. Air Force Academy in Colorado. Mr. Biden, who is the nation's oldest serving president at 80, was seen being helped up by Air Force officials and walking back to his seat on assisted. The president had been standing for about an hour and a half to shake hands with each of the 921 graduating cadets. Uh, the White House press pool reports that uh, um, he was seen jogging back to his motorcade, apparently uninjured, when the ceremony ended shortly after the accident. And the main news again, President Bola Tinubu today met with security chiefs for the first time since assumption into office. The president demanded stronger coordination among security agencies and told them he would not tolerate agencies working at cross purposes. 
And that's your news at 10 tonight. Thank you for watching. I'm Minister Walker. Have a good night and stay safe.